All right. Uh, today we're going to talk about Chapter 12, Licensing. Um, this is a new chapter for the second edition, and it's, um, I'm pretty sure, I don't remember it being there in the first edition. Um, it's really useful if you are open sourcing things to kind of have at least some understanding of how these licenses work. Um, and so the goals uh, that I put in here is that we want to be able to choose a license for your package, apply a license to your package, and then use license code in your package. Um, I do have the disclaimer up front. They have the disclaimer in the chapter as well. Uh, it's not, this is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. Um, if you are selling, um, like the actual code of your package, then you should talk to a legal professional or if you're using the package to create software that you are selling, um, in those cases, I think we say it a few times through here of talk to a lawyer in that case, but for the cases, kind of the regular use cases, um, Hopefully it'll be a little bit, uh, you know, this will help you out. Um, something that I think it was, it's important to call out is that by default, um, normal copyright applies. So if you don't put a license on your code, that doesn't mean it's free. That means the normal rules apply. Um, and so if no license specified, you're not giving anyone permission to copy your code. Uh, without express permission. Um, I think sometimes people think um, both this and the second point that um, like, oh no, it's just, I'm I'm putting it open, but you have to say that it's open in or order for it to be open. And likewise, um, open source doesn't mean that there's no license or no copyright. Uh, people think, oh, it's open source, so I can just copy and paste whatever I want. Well, no, there's still a copyrighted, you know, like the author of that code has rights still. Um, so authors still own their work and then licenses give you permission to use it with whatever restrictions the license might have. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, if you're writing code for a company or a federal agency, um, a lot of times someone will be involved, will we'll talk to you <laughs> about things. I still think it's useful to know, to have this chapter so you can respond intelligently because like sometimes companies are afraid to use any open source codes. Oh, you have to rewrite everything yourself. It's like, well, I mean, it depends on the exact code, but usually no. Um, and so it's good to be able to kind of uh, make them or tell them what they should read <laughs> basically. Um, all right, so who is the copyright holder? Um, if you write the code, um, on your own time, you own the copyright. You, that is, you know, your code. Um, if you write it under contract by default, uh, it's still your code unless something says otherwise. Usually on company time, you'll have something that says otherwise. You'll have something that says that it's a, you know, work product and that they own it and yada, yada, yada. Um, but it's not by default owned by your company. Um, again, though, if in doubt, discuss with a legal professional slash read your uh, employee handbook and that kind of thing. Uh, all right. And then they had um, basically two broad license categories. And then we kind of tacked down a third one here. So they talk about permissive licenses where you can freely copy, modify, and publish uh, anything that you make from that. And the only restriction is that the license has to be preserved with the code. Um, examples of this are MIT and Apache. And so you still have to like, um, you know, the, the code itself is still uh, licensed, but it, or it's, you have a license to use it. You can't just copy it and um, claim it's yours, but you can, you can use that code. Copy left licenses is the other category that they go into for open source code. Um, there, the code can be freely copied and modified, but you have to use, I, I, uh, the notes say the same license, but really it's a compatible license, which often means the same license. Um, for example, the uh, GNU GPL version three, which actually is not compatible with version two and vice versa. So you have to pay attention to which GPL version um, something uses. 
Um, if something requires, actually, it, we'll, we'll talk about the um, compatibility in a couple of slides. So I'll skip that for now. Um, and then the other kind of category that we added on here is uh, data uh, and other content. That's most of these licenses, the MIT, Apache, uh, the GPL, those are specific to code. And so um, something like CC0, that's Creative Commons, uh, zero means, um, it really means uh, uh, what you're open or not open source, but your public domain. You're releasing it into the public domain. It's free to use. There's no restrictions. In the book, they say that's roughly equivalent equivalent to MIT. Um, I think it's a little bit more permissive even than MIT. But um, the idea is you're saying this uh, data or this content is free to use. By the way, by default, uh, data is not copywritten, depending. Like it has to have a um, creative component effectively for it to be copywritten. We had a um, Tidy Tuesday all about that earlier this year. Um, so I was reading a lot of the law around that. Um, that's why if you read a, a recipe, there's always a story on the top of the recipe because the story can be copywritten, but the recipe itself can't be. Um, and then CC BY, or Creative Commons Attribution is what that's also known as. It's roughly equivalent to the GPL. Uh, you're free to use, but you have to uh, give the attribution, which means anything that's derived from it has to still give that attribution. Um, and so uh, it kind of inherits that license. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, human subjects, um, there are other legal protections, but it's not copyright at that point, generally. It's uh, you know, all kinds of different things, so. Watch out for human subject data. Um, I didn't actually, oh, I think I did recheck these, but these were in the notes already. They just uh, went through and looked at some of the existing like packages or R itself, our studio. Um, for the most part, the tidyverse is MIT, but I did check Lubridate is still GPL2. Um, I think it might wrap something that requires that. So uh, that's why it's still there. Uh, the survey package has GPL2 or GPL3, which is um, interesting. R itself is GPL greater than or equal to two. So it means two or three, really. And then R Studio is a GPL version three, which means if you wrap R Studio in something that you're trying to sell, um, you inherit that license. And you, you know, you don't want to like it, it's basically saying no, you can't just wrap R Studio and sell it. Um, and then Shiny is GPL3. Again, I think that one's because of some of the JavaScript things that it wraps, um, that it has to inherit that. All right. Um, yeah, across... I, have, I, have, I, have a, I have a comment, if you don't mind, on John. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned survey package. There is another package that uh, has a very similar functionality called Regenesis. It's developed by some Italian guy, uh, okay. and he's well, he's over aggrandizing himself on this work. Um, uh, so it was available from the whatever National Institute of Statistical Institute of Italy. He had support from the World Bank on this package, and I'm not sure what the what the um, what the licensing situation is, he used tons of structures and some of the code from the survey package. And Lamley said, um, that looks very familiar. <laughs> um, so yeah. I don't know what, what, what kind of arm ringing and, you know, um, uh, arm wrestling was happening behind the scenes. He, uh, so the Italian guy, recognizes Tom Lamley's, Thomas Lamley's contributions um, <laughs> more explicitly now, but it was it was a contentious point. So that's that's yeah. the real thing. So the, those licenses do matter. And, and that is something do, do, do yeah. come up in the actual yeah. And that's that's one of the popular packages. Yeah. Um there was 
a um, data set and like the code to generate it that I was looking into wrapping into an R package. And they put a, um, I think it was MIT license on all, like all of that. And then I went digging a little bit and something they used was GPL. And so it's like, no, you're not like, you think you're MIT, but you're not. <laughs> because you're using them or GPL code. And so you have to watch out for that. Now it is like, we'll talk about it in a second of it's a matter of, do you import the code or do you actually like copy and paste the code? Um, and we'll talk about that in a second here. So um, they did. So I can't remember part of this is at least is in the book um, that Across all programming languages on GitHub, um, of the open source licensed code, about 55% were permissive. Actually, I guess that's out of all of them. About 55% had one of the permissive licenses, MIT or Apache or something equivalent. And about 20% had copyleft, like GPL. Um, uh, by contrast, uh, Hadley or, and or Jenny did an analysis um, of CRAN in 2022. And yeah, um, CRAN is more heavily copy left and only 15% permissive. I I wonder how much of that is um, basically I've heard of GPL and so that's what I'll put on there. Like maybe people don't think about it. Um, I don't know for sure, but I, I would be interested to see kind of how this has changed over time. I know a few years ago, uh, they relicensed all of the tidyverse. I think it was from Apache to MIT, so it's even permissive to permissive. But it was a whole big deal, big process that they had to go through. Um, but yeah, Trevin pointed out that it seemed surprising to me for grand packages. Thought it would be reversed. I, yeah, I think, I really think a lot of it is people think it needs to be GPL in order for you to like get credit, and. Um, doesn't exactly work that way. And then on the other hand, and people are like, some people don't want their work to be used commercially, but it doesn't actually stop it from being used commercially. And I don't know if I write something, if I, I think there's a whole discussion of this on like Twitter and Mastodon right now of, oh no, GPL is fine. You can use that commercially. But I've definitely had legal teams who are afraid to use anything GPL because they're afraid of what it means. Even if they're wrong about it, they won't let you use it. Um, and so I I am a fan of MIT because I want people to use my code. I don't want to write, you know, why open source it and then people can't actually use it. Even, you know, yeah, use it to make money, cool. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a chat message about the package that uh, Stas was talking about. Anyway, so yeah, I'm a fan of MIT, but um, it's I think I, I definitely still see Apache. Um, we used Apache at my old job, um, largely because we went through a whole process and just went, you know, we started with, we want to open source some of the work we're doing. Let's just do what the Tidyverse does. At the time they used Apache, went through the whole process and got it approved that, okay, we can have Apache licensed code. And then they switched to MIT. And they had an argument for why they were switching. It's like, oh, yeah, it's probably a good idea, but oh, well, um, it was too late at that point. So, all right. Um, we have a couple of links in these notes. Um, there's this choose-license.com and a blog post by Colin Fay about licensing R. Um, so if you need further info, those are, I think both of those might be also linked from the book. And as I've said a few times, if you're like selling code or um, code derived from code or anything like that. If you're selling, like if you have a website that you are selling subscriptions to that is using these packages, you might want to talk to a lawyer. Um, all right, next up. Oh, so applying a license. Um, use this, it has these nice pack or nice functions to make it really easy to set your license on your package. You just do um, use blank license. So use MIT license, use GPL license, use CC zero license, um, use CC yeah. by license, or use proprietary license. 
there are arguments on these that you might need, uh, but you know, by default, start with kind of what the default arguments are and they should set you up nicely. Um, the proprietary thing is like, if you are doing something internal to a company and you want to keep it internal, it is still good to throw a license on there so that it's, you know, it's attached to the package. And so we used to use proprietary license for all the internal stuff we did. And then just had a standard file that we would include that says, you know, it's uh, not <laughs> released for public use or whatever. I don't remember exactly what we said, but just real quick, short note. Um, all right. There are several files that are involved in the licensing details of a package. And so this is good to know in case you're trying to read about what how a package works. Why did you uh, buy it so good? Sorry, what? I so. Oh, I don't think you're unmuted, Stas. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in the description itself, there is a license field. Usually this is the name plus a version um, like GPL greater than or equal to two or Apache two, um, or there can be these standard abbreviations, just GPL dash two, or GPL dash three, um, name plus a file. So MIT plus file license is what you'll see a lot of times. And that license file has a, um, uh, uh, like copyright information of year and people. And so that's, oh yeah, license file. Uh, further details about the copyright holder and um, year for MIT license, or sometimes that's the full text of a non-standard license. And then license.md is the copy of full license text, uh, which by default will be our build ignored because CRAN already has all those. And so they don't want you submitting them with every package where it's just the same file that's in every other package. Um, and then, okay, we're going to talk about the other file. Uh, oh yeah, the other files in a minute. For for the relicensing, they have a whole section on this. And again, I think this is largely because they did it and they were like, ah, this is a pain. Here's how you do it. Uh, I don't think it applies to most people. You're not going to be relicensing a package that has a bunch of contributors. Um, but the, the basic idea is you need to get permission or acknowledgement from all of your contributors if you're changing the license because they still own the copyright on their own code, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and there are some ways to, to kind of preemptively avoid that. But if you need to deal with it, it's in the book. Um, so code that's given to you, if someone does a PR on your package, um, it still is your license, but unless it's a typo fix, like if they write actual, you know, chunks of code, technically speaking, they own the copyright on that chunk of code, um, which is why if you're trying to change the license, you have to get their permission because their chunk of code is licensed with you, your old license and they own the copyright. Um, you can set up what's called a contributor license agreement or CLA to um, basically they have to do something uh, like you can build these into GitHub and they check a box saying that they assign the copyright to you. Um, I, I have seen this for uh, corporate things like um, I think Shiny or um, uh, like Plumber, those the, the the posit packages that are technically open source, but like deeply integrated into what posit sells. I think those are the ones that have a CLA attached. Um, and we used to do that at our, or for the ones that we did at the company that I worked at where we wrote some open source stuff, but we still needed to be able to deal with it basically. And so we had a CLA. Um, I'm not sure that we really needed to. And um, the places I used to see them, it has gone away because I think largely Git helps you, man or GitHub helps you manage that stuff. So. It's been less of a thing. Um, and then they talk about that as good practice just to be generous with uh, thanks and attribution. So um, in the tidyverse, they only put people in the description if they are like core members of the team maintaining that package. Um, but they uh, 
require effectively that everyone put a bullet in news about what they did. So if you contribute something, you put something in the news file about your contribution and they auto do an automatic scrape of their repos whenever they do a release to thank everyone who did anything. So like if you open an issue and then they explain to you why it's not a problem and you're like, oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, I've had that happen. And then you still get like thanked because you helped them think about their package. And uh, so they still want to give you attribution for that. Um, and there is code uh, somewhere. I think it's in use this um, dev tools to like generate the list of everyone who touched your repo within a certain frame time frame. Can't remember where that is, but it's somewhere in their packages. Um, <laughs> this chapter uh, is why every Monday, I think, in announcements, you'll see this message on R4DS from the Slack bot saying um, that anything you share on Slack is uh, CC0. Um, I went uh, to the full, like, you know, you don't need, I, I don't want people to have to give you attribution within their package if you answer a question. That doesn't seem right to me. Um, versus Stack Overflow actually uses CC by uh, share alike, which means that technically, if you copy paste code from Stack Overflow, you need to use GPL and you need to give credit to whoever you like link to the post where it was shared. Um, I don't think most people actually do that, but you should technically. We have had um, questions about this because it sounds like I don't know. It sounds like a bigger deal than it's meant to be, but I just wanted it there in case anyone ever tries to like sue someone for using their answer in code. That seems that I don't want that. And so uh, you have to uh, say otherwise for it to not work that way. Um, and it, like the, the note in here is just um, like this stack overflow thing was surprising. So it's worth looking at if you're like using a help site or something, see if they have license info. Um, it's not, you know, it's not that hard to put a link to uh, the stack overflow code, but the share alike aspect means that you need to use something like GPL if you use those stack overflow answers. Um, um, then they also talk about code you bundle. So like if you have a CSS or JavaScript library, um, that's fairly common with shiny packages that you actually like copy the code into your package. That'd be a case like this. Um, you might have a simple C or C++ library that again, you copy the code into your package um, or a small amount of R code that you copy from another package. There's actually a function in use this now of um, use standalone or something like that, that kind of lets you do this somewhat uh, automatically. Um, any of those cases where you actually copy the code into your package, you need to pay attention to what the licensing is of the original code. And we'll talk in a second about, um, <laughs> oh, I, I'll respond to the chat in a second, but um, we'll talk in a, in a second about like how to credit people with this, but you you need to probably give credit when you do this kind of thing. And there's the, the question or the comment um, in the chat. Um, yeah, so first part is um, if I ask somebody for a copy of the code in their academic paper and they send their ugly untested code, what license is it? What do I do with it after I put all the stuff that I need it to start working? Um, I don't... I, I would check, number one, like ask for clarification. If they give you express permission to use it, then you can have permission to use it. Doesn't matter what the license is for the most part at that point. Um, if the journal might say something, but you know, like if you're just copying it from the actual article, the journal might have a licensing rule. And so that'd be something to check. Um, and yeah, it might have to, it might by default it have something to do with the license of the journal, but I do know that like the journal just has the rights to print that article. They do not own the article. So you, like you can email the corresponding author of a article and usually get a copy of it from them for free. Um, and likewise, they could send you the code and 
from you know they could tell you how it is licensed um but that'd be uh worth looking into so yeah look at the site that it's on look at all that kind of thing um that's where the the fact that people think oh by default it's just free it's no it's not and so it'd be nice if they did include uh licensing info um and then the one million dollar question copilot and chat gpt um yep uh there are a lot of questions out there right now because they're using things that are GPL licensed to train those things. And so effectively you're getting GPL licensed code, but you're not giving people credit and you're not inheriting the license. Um, and so that is something that will be resolved probably eventually, uh, but right now it's not very well resolved. Um, and then I think an important thing that they talk about in here is that if you call code via exported functions and you you give you mention that package in your imports or suggests that does not impact your license so if you have gpl if there's a gpl package that you are using in your code by calling it the user has to respect the license in order to install it but you don't need to like inherit that license in your own code there i have seen arguments about this online um so that would be there that's something worth watching but there they have in the book the example of r itself is gpl but the r consortium or our foundation um i guess it'd be our foundation has talked about no it's not like we're not going to sue you for making your thing that you do in r commercial or um, you know, MIT licensed or whatever that, no, you can do that. You just can't distribute R itself um, without, uh, it, it, you know, you can't wrap the whole R language and distribute it without inheriting the license. All right. But yeah, the, the idea of that the package that you import doesn't impact your license is really helpful to think about because I have had things where I am wrapping a JavaScript library that is GPL or I'm including um, some sort of content that has a CC by license or CC by share alike license. And so you can, and they talk about this a little bit in the book that you can make a package that just does that wrapping. And then that package is GPL. And then in like your real package, <laughs> the place where you wanted to use it, that package can still be MIT and just call the GPL package. Um, I've never, I don't know, I've never actually had a case where it mattered whether it was GPL or MIT for anything I was working on, but you know, it could. Um, and so that's something to watch out for, I think. Oh, um, yeah, giving credit. So in the authors at R field, um, in your description, usually you'll wanna give credit with role equals CPH for copyright holder, and then a note of what are they copyright holder of? So it doesn't sound like they're the copyright holder of your entire package. Um, so again, for like JavaScript libraries, if you look at the shiny um, description, so the R package shiny, uh, there are, I think, uh, like a dozen of these of different li JavaScript libraries that they're wrapping, things like that. Um, and then separately, there's this file license.note where you can like describe you know, this package that I'm wrapping or this um, library that I'm wrapping has this license and this other end is copyright, copywritten by these people. Um, so, um, it's still, you're still importing Shiny. You're not wrapping Shiny. Um, the, so the question in the chat is just imagine Shiny is GPL3. That would mean that I cannot sell any Shiny app. Um, first off, I want to check that. Uh, oops, back in. Um, so it, we had it, yeah, it was, right? We had it on that other page and it was uh, license is GPL3. Um, I don't, I don't feel like that is the way they think about it. So yes, if you were to wrap Shiny, so if you make a Shiny executable, um, 
then you might start having issues because you're wrapping Shiny into this execu executable that you're selling. But if you are selling um, a thing that just uses Shiny, or, or like you made your own shinyapps.io, that might become a thing because you're basically selling the code for Shiny. Um, but using Shiny through imports is the very important part there that you can... Uh, I'm pretty sure you can, like, I think that there are commercial shiny apps that they have not made a big or a stink about. I think they want you to use it that way because then you're likely to pay for their commercial products. Uh, so, uh, but that is something interesting. Like that's where you would probably want to get a lawyer involved um, and try to, and find places where they have specifically said how they treat that, which they probably have somewhere. Um, yeah. All right. And oh, uh, license compatibility. So the general idea is that you can add restrictions, but not remove them. So uh, this is what, where I was just talking about where you can wrap the restrictive part in a separate package and then import it. Uh, there's this file or this image from Wikipedia that a previous book club put in here. Um, the basic idea is like top left is uh, completely open, public domain. You don't even have to say where you got it. Uh, you often should just to be like good and nice, but you don't have to. Through bottom right is that AGPL that is um, like the most contagious <laughs> form of GPL, basically. Um, yeah, and, and so I am curious, like, it's different. I, I I am pretty sure I am, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer, yada, 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 but I think you can still sell shiny apps. You just have to, uh, you just can't wrap all of shiny inside of your app. Um, I think that the point is with the license is when you want to create your own copy of the thing. So if I want to make my own shiny library. I need to, to use yes. that. But I just want to use Shiny as a service, you know, because the right. package is like an API mm -hmm. and you're using the service of Shiny. And I'm not right. making any modifications so I can grab my Shiny app as a proprietary Shiny so I can set it without sharing my, my code. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, and even if you do share your code, you can still like sell the result of that code. Um, and so there are all these different levels. Um, we didn't talk about this weekly protective level at all. That's the lesser GPL and the um, Mozilla public license, I think is the MPL. We can talk about BSD, um, but you know, you can kind of see the roughly where they stand. And the idea is general idea is that um, you can use things over on the left in things that are on the right, but you can't use things in, that are on the right inside of your things that are on the left. Um, all right, I think that, yeah, that's, that is it. So um, does anyone have any other comments, questions, thoughts? It's a, it's a really useful chapter. Um, I can remember like when it was the reason I don't think it was in version one is I remember Hadley asking for a lot of feedback as he was writing it to kind of um, get consensus <laughs> that what he was saying was what people were working on or working from the assumption of. Um, yeah. Yes. So um Kaija said, this is making me really curious to learn more about digital law since I'm sure these policies get violated all the time and most people are really not clear on the consequences. And then, so I think it's both directions. Like a lot of companies are over sensitive about these things and think, oh, I, you can't use open source um, because it'll poison, you know, then we can't sell our products or whatever. And it's the opposite, like the whole point of the open source licenses is to let you use these things commercially, but still credit the people who created them. Um, because it was, you know, that's 
was part of the open source movement is realizing people have to sell things in order for development to happen. Um, but yeah, through academia, um, it is probably the opposite. Yeah. Like you're saying the opposite of a corporate environment of where everyone's like, yeah, use whatever and you don't have to credit it because it's open source. And it's like, yeah, I mean, again, like I said, even the public domain ones, you should credit, <laughs> like they might've released it into the public domain, which is, it's nice to see, um, uh, government things tend to be, uh, not always, but often public domain. They'll say, you know, this was created through public funds and, um, they'll explicitly say that this is you know, licensed as CC zero on like some NASA sites and things like that. So it's worth looking. Um, but again, even if I use some Hubble telescope photo, um, I'm still going to say that it came from the Hubble telescope. Uh, and so, um, or I guess web would be the, the cool photos to use now. Um, but yeah, those are public domain, for example. It's good to know. Um, it's good to know that you have this chapter available. Um, they say again, um, and yes, adding a package to imports um, is the same as giving credit because of like the whole system of how uh, how CRAN works. That then you have to have the like in order to use that, you'll end up with the description file of that package that has all the credit inform information in it. Um, so that's the argument of why it is valid to um, to just import things and then that kind of results in credit. Um, I have found this chapter helpful even for things that aren't directly a package, but just thinking through like as a starting point at least of other things like with R4DS every once in a while, I have to make sure that we're not doing something that is going to get us sued um and so uh it's nice to have this reference and then the other thing to know about um copyright law is generally um if you are violating copyright you need you, you have a chance to respond if someone accuses you of that which can mean you just pull it at that point and then you're fine generally and so that's the other side of not freaking out if you're just using something for your own, you know, blog or whatever. Uh, like, you know, don't be crazy about it. But usually, if you respond to some to a takedown notice, then you'll be okay. Um, and the same is <laughs> like, but I wouldn't use, um, you know, Mickey Mouse after Steamboat Willie uh, in your R package just as the logo or something because. Disney's likely to sue you for that. Um, although you could use Steamboat Willie. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's that's the chapter. Uh, I think it's a really good one. Good to have available. Um, I'm curious. Uh, like the first footnote says, if you're selling your package, recommend consulting a lawyer. Um, I'm not sure if I can think of examples off the top of my head where mm -hmm. there's like a package you pay for. Like I um I can't think of a case. Um yeah, I don't have an example of that, it, you know, directly, but then there are things like shiny apps that I owe or you know. Uh, all the posit products that are built on top of open source. And mm. so they have definitely um, had lawyers consulted for those situations. Um, there could theoretically be a package that is not, like it has to be open source for you to install it, I think, but it, it could be a paid license. Um, I just, I can't think of an example of a package that does that. Um, but it's theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but then again, it's like, um, it depends how you're using it of whether you are doing anything that requires the payment of the package. So 
Um, yeah, I I don't have a case for that or an example for that, but I do think the the case. Um, yeah. Um, mm. But they're like, um, uh, uh, like the the term "random forest" is actually a copywritten term that has lost. Uh, yeah, and, and H two O was what was coming to mind of that they have a commercial product, but they also have open source packages that their commercial product is kind of like the and. Um, I think that they have a lot of info on how these things work. Um, like they they have presumably consulted lawyers quite a bit, quite a bit about what they can open source without, um, you know, knocking everything out. Um, but yeah, theoretically, like strongly suspect that there probably are paid packages, but none of us have heard of them because that's what happens if you try to close your package up too much. No one hears about it. So uh, that's part of the idea of open source is people actually will use your things and then you can have paid services on top of it, um, you know, support for your package, basically. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll be keeping an eye out. Let's see if I find any examples. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I am really yeah, curious. So I'm, 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 I'm making that sort of an argument for our stuff. So I keep just dispersing my uh, I mean technically the organization that I work for is a non-profit right so we're not trying to make some ridiculous amounts of money or whatever but we the company still wants to sell the intellectual property and make and it goes through the way of federal federal agencies that yeah. Well, we are a big federal contractor, so our intellectual property is something that we gonna tell federal clients. Well, this is what we are good at, and this is, well, hey, this is an eight million dollar project or whatever. But we are gonna be working on with you, and part of that project is, is this code that we've developed internally, blah blah blah, and that's what you're gonna be paying for. And um, yeah, and I'm telling, well, anything that we've written, Facebook can rewrite in two months, three months. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> based on the published methodology, right? So this stuff is in this paper, that stuff is, is in this technical report. You can piece the stuff together, throw a team of whatever, 5, 10, 20 Python programmers at it, <laughs> C programmers if you want to, if you want this to work real fast, Julia programmers. <laughs> and stuff, I mean, commercial stuff, it's just, well, Shiny, nobody's gonna be right. Shiny, well, because the product is sleek and smooth and that works well. Stuff that we gonna start charging for, there are other packages that are doing something in something similar. So for instance, there's this stuff. So as examples of um of the stuff that's commercial, uh one of one of the areas that I work a little bit in and other people in our company work more is called record linkage, where you have something like poorly adjudicated lists of people's names and addresses and zip codes and like age and some other indirect information, right? So, and there's stuff that's um, uh, this record leakage and entity resolution. And I look at it, well, I can clearly see this Python code behind that. And well, they're selling their licenses for whatever, $10,000. And uh, that's just Python code. So, um, that stuff does does get commercialized, and uh, likewise, well, there's probably some obscure instances of R code, and we just don't get to see. And there are, uh, I don't know, there's some real estate valuation thing. Well, it's a linear regression model with whatever or k-means clustering uh, behind the scenes. It may be running in Python, maybe running in R. We probably would not know. Uh, and there is a smart data scientist who wrote that and commercialized it, and uh, they are making money until somebody comes with a better version of this idea in, in a better working app. Um, and that's that's the kind of dark web of our programming, Python programming that we may not see, but I'm sure it does exist in the kind of 
end of the line commercial applications um, deeper in the industry. Oops, I was muted. Um, uh, before we do wrap up, I did want to, you know, point out that no one has signed up for next week. So, uh, uh, if someone wants to take that, it's a relatively short chapter, I think, and it's um, it's a nice like intro to how testing works, how test that works. Um, so if it's something you've wanted to learn about, that'd be a good one to sign up for. Um. But yeah, that's it for me. So I will see everybody on Slack. I have a question. Oh. Uh, you know, I have we have some example in quarter uh, for creating web, personal websites. And I see that one of the websites have a CC by. And I don't know if that also applies to the S C C S C S S a format the website is there. I mean so CC by um you can still like that's where you would credit them in the uh uh there's an example. Um, mm -hmm. Like credit them in the um, license or in the description, and that should be enough. Um, like copying the. But video. yeah, not CC. So this is CC by NC. Um, what is this? What am I looking at? It's his it's website. In yeah, personal website is in the Quarto Gallery. Gotcha. <laughs> and so if you're using it to make a derivative work. Yeah, basically the thing. theme, you know, no, yeah. no, the, no, the content inside of the website. Cause, but basically the theme of the website. That would be the the variables that they, they, they say, because it was based on, you say variables in the cascade. That may be the yeah on the score variables you see. Yeah. No, that's the CSS, oh, but it's the, the the S C S. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, those are uh, like it's interesting. I don't know what I would do with this. It's like um, I need to go to my website and, and put ah, that person's name because of the team or how would you give credit in that case? I think if I used this theme it, like in its entirety, yeah, I would like mention his name and link back to this repository uh, somewhere like down in wherever you put your copyright info on your site. Okay. Um, or technically just in the repo would also be fine. Oh, in the, um, okay, in the repo, most of the repo is also open, so I will give credit maybe in the yeah. readme file. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it, within the readme is probably fine. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer. The, throwing oh, the non-commercial yeah. mm -hmm. on there, mm -hmm. like, no, so, it's not commercial. You, know, you have to no. watch out. Yeah, but that does, you know, it means you have to watch out. Like if you're doing something, uh, there were, I think that was one of the examples of a thing that I had that uh, someone, the, the thing I was working with said, oh, it's just CC by. And then I went up a level. It's like, oh no, the thing that you are wrapping is CC by NC. Mm -hmm. You don't get to remove that. <laughs> and so it's still NC. So we couldn't use it for what I was trying to use it for, for work. Um, okay. So, but yeah, anyway. Uh, I would, you know, crediting them in your repo should be enough. Uh, if you have a page on your site that has any copyright info kind of stuff, throwing a mention of them there wouldn't 
hurt, but I don't know that it would be actually necessary. Okay, um, great. Yeah. I definitely right. recommendation. <laughs> All right. I will say stop again. I think mm -hmm.